Hello, everyone. Um, so this is going to be a team presentation, back and forth. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I know it's the end of the day, so I appreciate you all coming here, and you could have gone a lot of places. So um, today, we're going to talk about dialogue versus discussion, creating an environment of civility, mutual respect, and acceptance. It's a tall order, but hopefully we can uh, give you some guidance. So we're going to talk, first we're going to do introductions and what brought us to this topic. Um, so we're from two very different disciplines. So like what got us talking about this in the first place, uh, why we care and why we think this topic is important. Uh, and then we're going to talk about distinguishing dialogue versus discussion in kind of a technical sense. Those, use are off, those words are often used interchangeably, but we're going to use them in really specific ways. Um, and then we're going to go into some examples. Uh, Mohamed's going to share his experience uh, doing some of those exercises. And then we're going to actually do one, um, just really briefly, a fishbowl exercise. And then we're going to end with the Q&A and uh, hear, hear from you. Uh, th in the spirit of dialogue, we hope that you'll all talk with us about your experiences. Um, OK, so uh, I'm Avery Edenfield, uh, as the introduction said. Um, what brought me here was to rec I wanted to, I recognized the need to be intentional in teaching group work and collaboration. Um, I've been teaching group work since I started teaching um, in TechCom, and I noticed that I was bringing a lot of assumptions about ways students would interact with each other. Um, but I started to be much more intentional about how I was teaching it. I thought that students, I recognized that students uh, came in with a lot of baggage and a lot of assumptions. So I had to work with them on, on what I wanted them to do. Um, and I drew from my experience with cooperatives and collectives. Um, and I sat on a board of directors for co-ops for a while. And that gave me experience in mediation, collective management, and improv, which was relevant. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I have been teaching uh, social inequality, introduction to sociology, and race and ethnicity uh, for a while, and then we always cover controversial topics, and uh, uh, yeah, I realized that I need to promote mutual understanding uh, while discussing uh, controversial topics, so I have been assigning my students to write an autoethnography um, essay uh, to write their vulnerabilities Right, to write their privileges, uh, to share with us, uh, with me. So basically, uh, I, sh uh, I uh, provide them safe space to be more brave and then share their vulnerabilities. Next one. So why we care and why we think this topic is important. Uh, we care this because Utah State is, Utah State Univer University is a predominantly white institution. As you can look at me, I am an immigrant, right? So I want to feel comfortable while teaching my students. Very first day of my class, I asked to my, uh, my students to introduce themselves and also tell where their ancestors come from. And then they were like, why this is a question, right? And then and I, we, they realized that, they realized that 99% are immigrant. Right, and then I told them, hey, we are in the land of immigrants, and I am immigrant, so if we have a native Indian uh, students, and I am telling her or him, okay, thank you so much for hosting us in this land. So, um, th th yeah, that's why uh, this is an important thing, and, and we, again, we, I promote safe space, and students feel comfortable to share their vulnerabilities and, and privileges. So just a little bit about uh, distinguishing dialogue versus discussion. From this, I draw from Paula Allman. Um, I started teaching this uh, when my first class, 2010, uh, back in a long, long time, <laughs> nine years ago, I started teaching this. And I continue to draw on this, this piece where she distinguishes dialogue versus discussion. Uh, so discussions, although harmonious, uh, actually involve a sharing of monologues that often bear no relation to one another except that they address the same topic or question. Ideally, each person is supposed to be given the opportunity to state his or her ideas, answers, opinions, or, no or knowledge in questions as they pertain to the topic being discussed. When discussions are used as a teaching method, teachers try to ascertain the student's current level of understanding or accumulated knowledge and also use this format uh, to offer their knowledge and understanding to the students. They are responsible for the ordered and managed communication of monologues, right? So this, this is really familiar to me about how many of my classrooms go. Um, 
They're talking at me, and uh, there's an audience, basically, right? Um, the dialogical versus the dialogical exchange that takes place between at least two and usually many more members of the group is about investigating or exploring knowledge, not simply a one-way monological offering of someone's knowledge to the group, as would be the, the, the case in discussion. Already existing knowledge is always the beginning of the process of knowing, the development of deeper and more critical knowledge, and sometimes even the creation of new knowledge. So that's the goal, to get them in dialogue with each other, not just monologuing with me. Um, so that's, that's where we came. And I have uh, this whole complete excerpt. If you want that, um, I will share that with you. Um, just hit me up on an email. Uh, OK, so breaking that out a little bit more, distinguishing between dialogue and discussion. So if you're going to ask students to engage in dialogue, you have to teach it. I can't just assume they already know how to do it. Um, as a relatively new teacher, this is something that, that I had to come to. Um, so laying the ground rules at the beginning of the exercise is really important. Um, getting them to unlearn and then you know, learning how to do this. Always building in time for post-activity reflection. This is key. When I don't do this, uh, it just kind of seems to hang in the air. It doesn't necessarily seem like it's been wrapped up. Um, building in time for reflection um, gives them a moment to really kind of take a step back and see what happened when we, when we did this. So if it's improv, if it's a class activity, whatever we've done, building in that time to go, okay, what, what did we do? What happened? Uh, what, would you, what did you wish that you had done? Uh, what will you do next time? Building in those kinds of reflections is really important. Um, pay attention to social dynamics in the classroom, watching for bullies or students checking out. Um, uh, and having a vibe checker might be a good role to consider. So vibe checker will be someone who's kind of scanning the class, watching for, for folks who are kind of checking out, right? Um, that can be really important. And I came to this bully thing because um, I think I'm pretty astute, and I, I think I'm pretty good at watching class dynamics myself, but when I was, I was a TA at UW-Milwaukee, um, we did a, one of these exercises, and in the post-reflection, post-exercise reflection, I had a student mention bullying to me that he felt bullied in the class. And I, I was really stunned, because I had never picked up on any of that. And as he talked to, to me in the class about feeling bullied, the students just turned on him right in front of me, and I could really see it. So having, I mean, it was really scary. But, so having a moment where I could have kind of watched for that a little closer um, would have maybe helped that student feel a little bit safer. Um, it doesn't always happen in the open. Sometimes it's kind of in the background. Um, timing is important. The time of day and the time of semester can be really important for building in these ac activities. I just taught a class on uh, democracy and digital culture. Sounds exciting, but at 8.30 in the morning, oh, it was brutal. <laughs> they were all champs, though. They were champs. Um, it actually kind of helped to get them on their feet, moving, kinetic. Um, so engaging in dialogue, the important, what I have taken away from this is it teaches students how to express themselves with each other, um, to see each other as you know, members of a community. It, it teaches active listening. So not, again, not just monologuing with me, but engaging with each other. Um, it requires vulnerability and trust, not just from the students, but from also from the instructors. And Mehmet's going to talk about that in his example specifically. And it's asking students to consider multiple points of view, not just in opposition to each other or in an adversarial context. So you're trying to win an, a contest or you're trying to win a debate with each other, but you're actually saying, OK, that piece of knowledge put with this piece of knowledge over here, what can we say about that now? How can we build, build new knowledges together? Um, and also remembering the, the student conduct statement on civility that all interactions with faculty members, staff members, and other students shall be conducted with courtesy, civility, decency, and a concern for personal dignity. Okay, so some uh, example activities that we've done successfully. Um, so reflective structured dialogue is actually uh, in the peace building mo movement. Um, it's small group mediation technique. Um, it requires listening and uh, speaking over a set sort of time and then a, a block of silence following a speech. Um, it's designed to disrupt oppositional thinking or oppositional uh, positioning. So this has been used, for example, in neighborhoods with conflict with police. Um, uh, uh, I, I had the privilege of mediating a group on racism. Um, so it can, it's, it's designed to break down polarizing positions. A meeting house debate. Now, the difference between the debate is that it's two sides with an engaged audience. The audience is super important. 
Um, but it's not adversarial debate. The goal isn't to win an argument. The goal is to create new knowledge by knitting the two sides together. It takes some work, but it's been used with success, I think. Um, the, an affinity map, there's a lot of variations out there, but uh, basically prompting students to provide questions on sticky notes, that's the way I've done it. And then together we kind of group the, the questions together and then kind of answer them together as a class. So we're, again, creating new knowledge and dialogue with each other, putting the questions in dialogue with each other. And improv activities. The cool thing about improv is it's kind of like sneaky because it feels like a game, but uh, <laughs> it's a lot of activity and fun and it's very low stakes, but it's team building and trust building. You have to trust each other um, and collaborative, right? It also can be used as a creative warm up. But the fishbowl technique is something I've done almost every year since I started teaching. Um, and I, I, the one I use is from UNICEF. So um, are there other activities that folks have done that aren't on here, but that you might, you think kind of looks like this, where you're getting students to engage with each other, with the goal of creating new knowledge, dialogue with each other, not just monologuing. Is there anything that someone wanted to share? No? Okay. If it comes to you later on, uh, you can speak up later on about that. Okay. All right. So uh, as a professor, uh, we, I, we, yeah, we value trust. So we need to construct trust between me as an authority, right, in the classroom and with students. If you don't construct or build the trust between uh, between professor and students, they are not opening themselves actually. If you are talking about the controversial topics, they try not to share their opinion. I experienced that. But when I, or you can ask me how we can build trust between a professor and students. My way is this. I share my vulnerabilities first. As an immigrant, as a Muslim you know, professor, sociology professor, uh, I share my own vulnerabilities with the students. Uh, and also that empowers me as well. So they learn that when they share their vulnerabilities in autoethnography or in the, I'm not forcing them to share their vulnerabilities actually. But I see that I felt the empowerment from them actually, right? So when you build the trust, everyone's strategy would be different, right? But when you build the trust, there is a really healthy dialogue between you and students, right? Students started to not to see the boundaries between professor and themselves or um, uh, among the students as well, right? So again, trust, dialogue, and also, as you can see over here, all the activities are student-centered activities. And every and I, we are, you know, our teaching philosophy is based on student uh, centered activities. So one of the activities, one of the activities I am using, actually I stole this idea from Avery. So, and that's, that works too in my class in social inequality. Uh, so, and uh, especially in social inequality, again, uh, we have a lot of controversial topics, right? So I use fishbowl technique, not a first day of class, not a first month of the class, but like at the end of the class, like a last month of the class, right? Why? Because after I gain the trust, after I gain the dia dialogue in the classroom, right? And students feel comfortable to share their stories. And again, I start, uh, with my own vulnerabilities. I share my own immigration story with them as a professor in front of them in flash, right? So if I ask you, what kind of construction of immigrants in my student's mind? What do you think? What kind of immigrants, refugee or asylee in my student's mind? How do they construct refugees or immigrants in their mind, right? Politicians are shouting about their rapists or this or that, right? So they're asking me a question. I am sitting in the middle 
right? The first circle, and Avery will give more, uh, more details about it. And they are asking me questions, right? How did you pass the border? I didn't pass the border. Okay, I came here for education. Oh, really? We thought that immigrants need to pass the border, right? In Mexico, they thought that those immigrants are coming from there only, right? So I am, I have a PhD, right? They, they break down their stereotypes through the fishbowl. Or LGBTQ community, right? We have a ally community, LGBT community in Logan. And um, the, the topic in social inequality was LGBTQ community. I was like, oh, I'm gonna, how am I gonna apply this topic uh, to fishbowl? So, because students need to participate in, right? And I was like, maybe I can imitate or act like a gay person and then sit down and then they can ask me a question to show fishbowl technique. And all of a sudden, one of my students said, okay, I, I can be part of this. I wasn't expecting, but I feel the empowerment. And she said, and then we ask questions, right? We ask questions, and you know what? She shared her own vulnerabilities. She was in um, conversion therapy in Idaho. We weren't expecting, I was shocked at that time, right? I was watching and I watched uh, Boys Erased uh, to get more knowledge about the difficulties, vulnerabilities, but I wasn't expecting from my students to share her own story and her family disowned her I was, oh my gosh, and I was overwhelmed. And one of other students came to the, what is that? It came to the center as well, and she shared her own vulnerabilities in Logan as well. Oh my God. And the other students came to the center as well, and then he said, you know what? My sister, my, my sister had a problem. He, uh, he didn't come out yet to my parents because of this, because of that. I was like, oh my gosh, the miracle of the fishbowl. <laughs> but the, uh, but the before, trust, dialogue, right? So right now, okay. So uh, the way the, as Bomet alluded, the way the fishbowl works is, and there's a lot of variations. So there's two circles. There's an inner circle uh, with, where I give students a prompt, uh, usually an open-ended question. I have volunteers sit in the circle, uh, and then there's an outer ring where students sit uh, and with notes and take notes of the dialogue. So uh, they, students are intended to, uh, it's, a, it's designed so that students will watch the dialogue as it unfolds and take notes. So who gets interrupted? Who, uh, who speaks more often, right? Who feels empowered to speak? What happens when a new person in, uh, joins the group? So uh, you can join from the outer circle, you can join by like tapping the shoulder, and then you'll switch places. So uh, I usually set it up so that everyone should be in the inner circle at least once. But the, the reflection afterwards is key. Being able to like, okay, break out the circle. Uh, let's all like just talk about what kind of dialogic dynamics did we see? Uh, you know, were men more comfortable speaking? Were women more comfortable speaking? Who was silent? Uh, who was interrupted? Who felt, uh, you know, what happened when somebody entered? That kind of thing. Um, so it, it gives us that sense of like uh, understanding the kind of dialogue that we have in the classroom that's, that's kind of unfolding. So um, if we have time, uh, we, have, we do have time. We have 10 minutes. Um, we could do a, a little yeah. exercise. Do you guys want to do an exercise? Do you guys want to see how the fishbowl unfolds? So I, I thought we'd be in a classroom, like classroom where we could have things designed so, so that we can like kind of do that. But we don't have that. So uh, you're going to have an audience. Um, can I get three volunteers? <laughs> Come on up. Okay, you got a you got a good question. We need a question. <laughs> okay. All right. We need one more volunteer. One more. Come. Yes. All right, awesome. Okay. All right. So we're gonna just go. I, there you go. That's that's perfect. Okay. Um. So. We're going to do just three rounds. So I want you, if you feel like you want to come in and contribute, come up, tap the shoulder, jump in, okay? We're just going to do like maybe two rounds if we have time for that. So open-ended question. Um, 
So benefits of dialogue versus discussion. Let's just start there. OK, uh, go. Everyone, like, watch the dynamics. Pay attention to the dynamics. So they ignore each other and it's this tunnel. And the hard part is is when they talk to me and I can't I can't connect what they're saying to something else and I'm just begging for another student to jump in and they don't. So I can see the benefits of dialogue and of students being able to connect each other's ideas because I know I don't know everything like I know that. But I and it's intimidating for me when they're looking to me as a source of all knowledge and only answering to me because I don't know everything and um, I may not agree with what they're saying. And I don't want to be the only one that doesn't agree. So those are kind of some of my thoughts. I think uh, one thing we often forget, or maybe we're just uncomfortable with, is the silence. Mm -hmm. So I think if we just kind of take a little minute and have some silence, then we'll, you'll get that out of, out of your class, I think. <laughs> There's the silence. There is the silence. I'm, I'm trying to implement what you just said. I'm trying to <laughs> be incorporative. Um, this is something that I've seen happen. I, I taught it well once years ago when I was like a grad assistant in law school. I've never done it since, and I just realized it now that I'm terrible for not implementing this better. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, uh, I teach a, a couple of law classes, and so I can sit there and lecture people, and people look at the professors like, oh, you are the authority. You're the one who's done this. You're the one who knows what's going on, which may or may not be true. But there are concepts, I think, that have to be taught with the dialogue aspect. For example, uh, with a law question, right? Did someone commit a crime or did they not commit a crime? It's not so much what do I think. I mean, if, it was, if there was one right answer, there wouldn't be defense attorneys and prosecutors, right? <laughs> and so the question is, you get an issue out there. You throw out a question. I did this once. It was this class. It was the, um, to put it nicely, it was the people who did not do so well their first semester of law school. And so they had to go to this let's get your stuff together class to try and not fail out because they didn't get that concept of there wasn't only one right answer. You got to realize the concept we're learning and how you argue it. And I think this whole discussion sort of spins around that. You know, I could sit there and lecture them and say, this is the answer. This is what it should be. But it seemed like once you got it, at, you know, you got people saying, okay, should this lady be convicted of murder for leaving her kids in a hot car or should she be acquitted? You've got people say, oh, definitely she should be, you know, thrown in jail. And others say, yeah, you should be acquitted. And then they get going against each other, and they realize there's different ways of seeing things. They learn more from talking to each other than they ever did listening to me. And then I look like a genius for sitting there and somehow facilitating nothing, really. I just sort of throw a question out there. So maybe I'm just doing way too much work. Maybe I just need to throw it over more. I, was, I struggle with when... In the dialogue, if things get heated, maybe it's my, when do I jump in? And as my, with my positionality as a, as a professor, how? And what if I jump in and it, it's not effective? So this, the dialogue thing for me, I'm like, brilliant. Like, let's work together. Let's create knowledge. Let's talk to each other. But then a part of me, I'm standing there the whole time going, gosh, I really hope this doesn't get out of hand because I don't know what I'm going to do. If I have to jump in and, and say, like, stop yelling at them and, and please don't hit me with your book. I mean, that might not happen, but that's what goes through my mind. And, and when I turn the conversation over to the class, how am I going to get it back if they don't want to give it back to me? Yeah, I mean, I think also, too, like, uh, I think being, af like being afraid of, like, like conflict and, and, and discussions and dialogue is really scary. Um, but I also think, like, um, should I, like, how much can I ask of a really quiet student? Yeah. Um, and is, like, how much is it fair to ask them to engage? I don't know. It's tough. Uh, it, I mean, I want to respect everyone's learning style, but at the same time, like that's kind of scary to me. You guys can tap in. Anybody want to tap in and contribute? Because we almost said no. They're the silent students. Oh. <laughs> oh no. See, it's hard to kind of because I'm breaking the, the fourth wall here. Um, but it's hard because like the way this dynamic of the classroom is set up right now, we're almost like performing for you. But um, going, get this going. You spend 50 minutes doing this. I think we have like 10, but if we had 50 minutes, then you, 
we would get into a much more relaxed kind of flow, right? And especially if we require everyone to get in the middle at least once, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thanks, cool. thanks everyone. Um, okay, so I want to turn it back to you. Uh, what, what are your questions? What, what did we not answer? What do you think about this? What are your fears for putting this in your classroom? Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so what are some of the dynamics that you noticed? Yeah. The one who asked the question, I felt very um, invasive about tapping her out because I felt like she was a, an integral part of the conversation. I didn't want to exclude her from the answers that people were giving. Yeah. Yeah. But whenever she wants, she can come back. So no worries about that, right? Am yes. I right? Yes, yeah, she can always come back in. But I, I think that's true. I think, you know, maybe you could have tapped on me or tapped on someone else. But that is something that I think people sometimes have a sense of, like, where is this conversation going? And do I really, you know? So I have seen it where students will stay in much longer than other students because of that reason. Uh, what are some of the other dynamics that you notice? Uh, Stephen, and then. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, but he was also sitting here facing you, so there may have been a sense of like a lecture kind of sense, right? Versus like Cree and I sitting here and, oh, I don't know where he's, oh, there he is up there, right? You have less of a sense of like I'm speaking to an audience and maybe more of a sense of like we're dialoguing with each other, right? Um, what, what you mentioned? Uh, perfect clockwise turntable. <laughs> yes, that's almost always uh, some, uh, something I always notice. Um, so that would be what the reflection would look like, right? Um, if there had been, if it had gone on for 30 minutes instead of like 10 minutes, you would have much more to talk about, I think. You start to notice like when people pause, thank you, when people like, what happens when someone new enters, people often either jump to them right away or sometimes they kind of get ignored and just like have to sit there for a while. Yeah. So I, you asked for volunteers and like two white guys jumped up almost immediately. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever do you ever feel like you need to manage like who comes up there? Like if somebody stands up and you're like, whoa, easy there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. That's a great question. You know what? I honestly don't. I don't manage. I've actually tried to manage and have students be like, you're breaking the rules. <laughs> you're, not, you're talking out of turn. Um, I, let, I hope that students will pick up on that. And if they don't pick up on that, then I will usually bring it out in the reflection. Yeah. So how do you, how do you, I don't know how to ask it very well, but you've got this reflection going on. How does that, how do you keep it safe for the people that were doing the discussion that they don't feel like what they were doing was going to end? Yeah, that that's a great question. Um, hopefully everyone would have had a chance to get in there. Um, so they've all kind of had their hands dirty in a sense. But yeah, I don't always have a good answer for that, and I'm sorry, but um, I just try to hope that the totality of the class over the entire semester shows that they were respected and none of us get out clean. Um, you know, we've all kind of been in it together. I hope that that's what happens. I do try to pick up on positive dynamics as well as some of the, the more negative ones. Honestly, I rarely see negative things, but. It does, I do notice a quality, an increase of the quality of discussions in terms of dialogue after the exercise versus what was going on before. Yeah. Um, do you ever have problems with groupthink where an idea spawns and a group of people latch on to it and then others who don't think that way hesitate to speak up? Oh gosh, yeah, definitely. I did. I saw that one of the last times I did this. Oh man, something really got spun out of control. Um, that's when I jump in. Um, I'm in there too. I can tap in as well. And that's, as long as I follow the rules, apparently that's really important. <laughs> Students really harp on that. If I follow the rules, then, then I usually go, but wait a minute. But what about, you know, that's when I can usually kind of do that move and kind of steer it another way. But that is something you definitely I think you have to watch for. And hopefully, again, like in the reflection, we're picking up on that. Because you have like 30 students who are also watching that unfold, hopefully. Yeah. Um, we have three more minutes, I think. Uh, yeah. I have a question about something that was mentioned a bit earlier. So there was a list um, on one of the slides of sort of different types of activities. 
Yeah. yeah. And the first one was oh, a smaller reflection. Yeah. Reflective dialogue. Mm -hmm. I Um, yeah, so it's a very structured conversation with like timed responses. Um, I'll just talk about the way that I was trained at the Ziegler Center in Milwaukee. Um, so the way I was trained was uh, it's a small group. Uh, you provide a question, an open-ended question. Each person goes around and speaks for two minutes, exactly, and then they stop. And you sit for about 90 seconds in silence with that conversation. With, that, with their voice, so their voice is the last thing kind of hanging in the air, and then you go to the next person. And there's no crosstalk. You only answer that question from your perspective. And then you go around, and then you answer another question, no crosstalk. There's some ground rules like I statements, you know, uh, no big generalizations like all cops are whatever, all teachers are whatever, you know. Um, and at the end, then you open it up for questions to each other. Um, so it's a really in, like, structured technique designed to get people to listen to each other. I honestly, to be fair, only used it one time with the intergroup conflict, um, trying to a uh, group that was having a lot of problems with working with each other. Um, so using that to kind of get them to listen to each other. Um, so yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I have a question about this, about what was being said about a safe space, a brave That's, space. Um, Uh, as I said before, uh, I have been uh, doing this technique uh, very uh, late of the semesters, like, right? So I have been always constructing and building trust, dialogue, civility, statements, and you know they learn through the semester. Uh, okay, you have a, a you know different opinion about the different topics, but you need to re be respectful while sharing, right? And also. Uh, political correctness, right? I'm trying to teach political correctness as well in the class. So if you don't care political correctness, right, uh, while talking, uh, I need to get you out of my class uh, that time. So because we need to respect each other, right? So. And also, uh, actually, during the semester, you are showing that you are respectful. As a professor, you are respectful for every opinions. So they, that's why they trust and they share their opinions as well. Okay. So, so there's a lot of instruction. Yeah, yeah. I guess, that's it. yeah, thank you so thank much you. for coming.